Right. So good morning, uh, everyone. And thank you so much for joining us for our Association of Asia Scholars uh, webinar today. This is the fourth session uh, that we have uh, organized. And uh, we sincerely apologize for the delay in starting. And we have a very eminent speaker with us today, Professor Han Hua from Beijing University. And uh, the topic that she's going to be speaking on is China's foreign relations in the context of the global pandemic. Is Beijing under siege, uh, given the kind of responses that are coming from different countries? So uh, as we have informed you earlier, our association is continuing to organize uh, the series of uh, webinars uh, every Wednesday morning at about uh, 11.30. Uh, next Wednesday, we have Professor Ian Hall from uh, Griffith University from Australia. So uh, he will be speaking to us and we will, of course, be confirming the timing when we have people from different time zones. So for the, for the previous uh, webinars, our, the report as well as the uh, recording of the webinars, in case any of you have missed it, uh, is also on our website, Association of Asia Scholars. And we're also very pleased to announce that uh, our journal, Millennial Asia, which is a joint publication with SAGE, for the last two years, we've been having three issues a year. And uh, this uh, time, we have a special issue coming on. So the call for papers uh, related to COVID pandemic and its impact on different countries so that call for papers is also visible on our website, Association of Asia Scholars. And right now we are live on Facebook, uh, on our page, Facebook page, that is the Association of Asia Scholars uh, Facebook page. So thank you once again for joining us this morning. Sorry for uh, the delay of eight minutes. And Professor Swaran Singh, I'll hand this over to you to please welcome our speaker for today. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Rina Marwa. I am delighted that things have worked fine. Uh, I am uh, happy to see Hanhua has uh, joined us. Uh, I repeatedly keep thanking all the participants uh, who are actually our strength. Your interest is what makes us uh, continuously go forward. And we are able to get uh, far more uh, really senior and serious uh, academic scholars to come and speak on our platform thanks to your uh, uh, participation and indulgence and engagement with our series of webinars. Uh, as Rina just mentioned, we have lined up a few very important speakers uh, in the coming weeks as well. Uh, I am greatly delighted to introduce, uh, uh, first of all, very briefly, because we all want to hear uh, the Beijing University professor, uh, Han Hua uh, uh, and, and I go back to 21 years. We first met in a, a three-week long symposium of the Pacific Command of the United States. And at that time, uh, you know, we had a lot of energy and we, we could travel and do a lot of things. And we traveled as a team uh, to Japan, Korea, and the United States. That was very great learning experience. For me, immediately great advantage was uh, that Professor Hanwha hosted me next year in this prestigious Beijing University School of International uh, Studies next year as an Asia Fellow. And Rina keeps telling you that we are Association of Asia Scholars. So when I received my uh, one year of fellowship to go to another Asian country, uh, I definitely wanted to go to China, but I think it was a great privilege to know a professor from Beijing University that I managed to get accommodated, get affiliated to Beijing University. Uh, and since then, I have seen uh, Professor Han Hua grow enormously. And uh, to my great uh, pleasure, she is not only the leading expert on arms control and disarmament from China, uh, she has had several visiting professorships in the United States, Korea, Japan, and many other places. My great pleasure is that she, over years, has also developed enormous interest on South Asia. And uh, partly because nuclear issues uh, erupted in South Asia, and that, that was partly the reason. But maybe I contributed somewhere to that interest in Professor Han Hua. Uh, so uh, it's easy for all of us. If any of you want to know more about it, just Google her name and you will find a whole lot of information. But I don't want to stand today between you and Professor Han Hua. We are 
very excited to listen to today how she explains us this china's foreign relations during a global pandemic and you know many people are today seeing that perhaps beijing is under siege uh, as several great powers are today kind of appearing to be angry uh, with china uh, so we are looking forward to hearing from the famous uh, professor from prestigious university to tell us how she from china perceives is beijing under siege or not and if it is so how is beijing preparing uh, to deal with that siege and then turn that challenge into an opportunity as chinese always tell us uh, it's my pleasure and honor to invite now to uh, professor han huo to please uh, take the platform and share your thoughts with us professor han huo thank you uh, swarin and thank you uh, rena really a pleasure for me to join the very interesting because i have uh, already enjoyed uh, the meetings a uh, couple of uh, times and uh, really enjoy the discussion and the uh, comments among the indian friends and uh, counterparts so today i have the honor to share some of my initial uh, thoughts about uh, china's foreign relationship uh, amid the uh, the global pandemic um may maybe um my thought uh, are not so well developed because uh, still the process is still going on and i have to uh, really uh, keep uh, uh, observe observing the whole process before i got a really conclusive uh, remarks but now let me really jump into the today's uh, discussion the topic uh, about the chinese foreign policy um, during the pandemic so firstly let me talk a little bit about uh, what happened before the outbreak of the pandemic actually uh, several months before the outbreak in wuhan uh, in september 2019, uh, actually WHO and other uh, health and um, medical uh, uh, institutions, they jointly published a report, very important one. The name is Award at Risk. But I mean, the, uh, the countries around the globe uh, have not, uh, I had not uh, really paid that much attention to that report. Uh, actually, that report really talked about the, not pandemic per se, but uh, talk about the health, uh, something happened against uh, the public health. So, um, uh, after some kind of, uh, lack of uh, communication, lack of the, uh, the discussion about the report. Um, China's Wuhan, the center of the country, really broke um, the first case uh, of um, COVID-19. Uh, they really can put this as a kind of the first, the and the biggest uh, black swan, uh, in China, maybe around the globe. Um, and chi China's, uh, I mean, China's uh, the initial response uh, was a little bit uh, panic, uh, panic because it was uh, the first time to really got to know that disease. So, and also it happened during the Chinese uh, uh, Lunar New Year and the people still in the mood of the <laughs> celebration of the new year uh, but something happened and uh, suddenly wuhan was uh, locked down and uh, all of the country almost uh, all the cities or provinces they have to lock on uh, and also um, they have to spend the very long uh, chinese new year holiday at home but unfortunately, after a while, other countries like Italy, uh, Iran, and others, uh, I mean, the, the cases are growing, and also uh, the whole countries are 
uh, lockdown, some of the countries at least. But so far, we have uh, over 6 million cases, uh, 400,000 deaths toll uh, through all of the, the world. So that kind of uh, um, <coughs> really has his uh, impact uh, on the globe in different perspective. In economic field, globalization and production line supplies are at risk. And social chaos also um, broke out in many of the countries. And also now we can see what happened in the US. And also what we are going to talk about is a geopolitical rivalry intensified by the breakout. Um, it's my, my turn. But let, let me say, uh, before uh, the pandemic, uh, I think uh, there had already uh, existing shift of balance of power around the globe or among the, the major powers. Um, since the end of the Cold War, um, uh, US enjoyed the unipolar uh, world and also si several other uh, major powers. In Chinese world, we call Yi Chao Duo Qiang. But since 2008, the distribu this distribution has been in new transformation. I mean, uh, from 2009 to 2019, gap of the two largest economics, I mean, uh, namely the US and, the, and China, uh, I mean, the gap has already uh, narrowed down rapidly. The Chinese GDP from 2009, 30% of the US GDP to in two, uh, 2019 is already 66 of US GDP. And also um, the, the largest the two economics take lead far ahead of the rest of major economies. Um, I mean, compare uh, China with the third place uh, country, I mean, Japan, um, China's GDP 91% in 2009, but now uh, 2019 is already 274% of uh, Japan's GDP. So you can see the, the shift of the balance of power. And now we are talking about what does that mean, uh, the shift of power? Does that mean a bipolar world plus major powers a little bit behind the two economics? Or we are going to have a multipolar world? Um, I mean, now we can see the China's are slowing down. Uh, amid U.S. trade war, while U.S. Uh, the growth rate is uh, two, it was 2.3% uh, growth rate last year. And also now we are seeing a kind of anti-globalization and trinity and also trade protectionism. Uh, if we really put those uh, new for sure, what direction we are going to, to bilateral, uh, bi bipolar world or to a multipolar world. Uh, but uh, in any uh, scenario in the, in the future, China has been seen as a serious challenge to US uh, hegemony. Um, it started, uh, from Obama's uh, strategic rebalance and strategy um, from 2010. Um, but now, um, under Trump administration, uh, China has, seen, uh, has been seen as a revisionist state. Uh, if you, uh, you really read the uh, national strategic strategy, or other important uh, security uh, security related uh, documents in the uh, Clinton, uh, sorry Trump administration. 
And now we have seen um, the trade war and other checks uh, on China from Trump administration. And also we have seen um, Taiwan issue and Hong Kong issue even. Um, most Chinese uh, perceive those uh, internal affairs, uh, the Chinese internal affairs, but now it is a kind of a core or clear uh, I mean, issues uh, on the US China agenda. Um, China now is uh, in center of a blaming game, as uh, uh, Dr. Singh just mentioned. China is one of the first uh, countries which have managed getting out, getting out of the spread of uh, COVID-19, and China has been the target of the blames. For example, people talk about the Wuhan virus, and Wuhan is uh, labeled as the origin of COVID-19. And second uh, label is China's cover-up and cause global pandemic. And also China has taken advantage of a global pa pandemic to seek his uh, job to other countries. According to Trump, um, China-centric and by the, the objective assessment based on facts and scientific research. Um, for example, we talk about a part of uh, uh, the White House tactic of shui guo in, uh, um, in Chinese term. Shui guo means um, they have to find a good play of the due, uh, of responsibility of uh, Trump uh, administration and also uh, kind of a fear of China's quick recovery from COVID-19. Also, um, also caused the other countries to really uh, are uh, anxiety, have uh, anxiety about uh, what's going to, to have uh, in the future uh, after China's quick recovery from the COVID-19. And also, we, we have already seen so many uh, scientific uh, journals uh, talking about uh, uh, how they think uh, the uh, the COVID nineteen coming from, uh, or um, they apologize uh, for two, twice um, because they blame China as the origins. And also, we keep uh, seeing more evidence coming out of different countries. Uh, saying what the maybe the zero case uh, of uh, the the first case um, started in their own countries. So, but I don't want to talk too much about uh, the Chinese. Uh, also, debate about uh, what's going on uh, and what what the China's uh, responsibility should be. But uh, I would like to say uh, the challenges caused by the COVID-19 of China's foreign policy. Um, as I said, uh, the existing strategic competition has, uh, has been there for a couple of uh, decades. And the COVID-19 uh, has uh, intensified uh, this kind of a competition. And China is facing daunting uh, challenges, for example. Uh, but I list uh, maybe four uh, for our discussion. The first one is the free fall of Sino-US relations. I will go through one by one, but uh, let me um, put the four challenges together now. The second one is the emerging US containment uh, diplomacy in China's uh, periphery and uh, taking side the dilemma among the Chinese neighbors. The third challenge for China is this uh, ordin ordinary uh, or reordering of the global and the regional regime or multilateral institutions. The last challenge is anti-globalization uh, and also the coming breaking of China's uh, supply chain. Let me go through one by one. 
uh, firstly, the Sino-US relations. Um, some warnings are already there. For example, um, Kissinger, the uh, senior politician, he uh, wants uh, want of ca uh, catastrophic catastrophic uh, conflict unless China and the U.S. settle their differences. And uh, Allison, uh, Graham Allison, the professor at Balfour Center, Harvard University, also talk about uh, the shoot, shoot, shoot it, uh, trap scenario uh, between U.S. and China. Um, so um, the the two countries are, are in kind of a collision um, in many perspectives, many fronts. Uh, but between the two countries, scholars, uh, I mean, are try have been trying to uh, to to record or appeal the two countries' leaders. Uh, really uh, calling for gr um, global solidarity and co cooperation against the polarization or stigmatization of the uh, ep epidemic. Uh, in the beginning of uh, April, the two big groups of uh, scholars from um, both countries, uh, I mean, perspectively, send letters to um, public or the administration uh, calling for the cooperation. Unfortunately, as I said, all front competition already been there, uh, competitions. Um, uh, technologically, uh, trade field, financing, uh, financial field, ideological, people to people, narrative, and military even. Um, we talk too much about Huawei or ZTH uh, in Chinese word, Zhongxing. Uh, and also we talk about the, the first phrase of a trade agreement and the implication between the two countries. Uh, even they are talking about the implementation is still going on. Uh, even um, some pro provision under the agreement says if something uncontrolled uh, the situation happened, the agreement um, maybe could uh, get second thought in their uh, implementation. And also now uh, the Chinese or Trump administration really taking strict, uh, uh, strict uh, restriction about the Chinese uh, visa or students, uh, in especially uh, some universities in China, uh, which have uh, been labeled as relationship with uh, high tech or military developments. And also we have already seen um, Taiwan issue uh, or re-election in Taiwan, um, how the two countries, uh, I mean, had uh, some kind of a military uh, exercise or other warnings uh, along the, the, the line or the coastline. And South China say too. Um, so if we talk too many um, bad things happening between these two countries, can they really tell there's uh, still room for stable relationship, uh, if not better relationship? Uh, but in China, we, we have, we are having debate about how we can deal with uh, uh, Sino-American relations. But some scholars in China, they think uh, maybe three um, bottoms, uh, bottom line um, should be preserved. Firstly, military war should not be engaged. Secondly, certain level economic and trade relationship should maintain. And lastly, people to people contact should be maintained too. Otherwise, the, the 
two countries um, maybe um, because of the sentiment um, getting from partly from the pandemic. You can see the uh, an irrational or with a very high sentiment uh, propaganda or narrative or rhetoric. Um, uh, I mean, you, you can say the conflict. So basically we think um, the complete decoupling between the two countries uh, uh, is not uh, possible because the too many perspectives or too many um, fact factors uh, really put the, uh, still keep the two countries together. Uh, even they talk about the decoupling, it takes a long time to, to really complete the whole process. Uh, second uh, challenge, let me uh, talk a little bit about the emerging U.S. containment uh, diplomacy in Chinese uh, periphery. Um, I think um, uh, as uh, they, you already well um, noticed that uh, uh, Trump's Indo-Pacific strategy has been there, especially after the 2017. Uh, people talk about the resumption uh, or the uh, new uh, new uh, and suicidism, uh about the, the quad, uh, and also we talk about uh, the new alignment uh, diplomacy um, based on the current U.S. Uh, bilateral alignment system in Asia. Uh, but now we are talking about the old or traditional alignment system based on bilateral al alignment arrangement into a, a kind of a transition into alignment network. Um, according to some officials uh, in Washington DC, and also we have already seen Australians a growing or more proactive role in U.S. alignment uh, practice. And also now uh, in couple of um, um, last two, over the last couple of months, uh, people talk about uh, the Quad Plus, two versions. Last uh, webinar uh, meeting, uh, Dr. Panda just mentioned those versions. I think it's very interesting and also that also uh, kind of a Chinese um, scholars concern about uh, what the direction of the alignment system, um, I mean, moving into in the near future. But uh, for some the Chinese, including me, I think the U.S. realignment uh, we, uh, uh, diplomacy uh, has something has some limitation because we still think uh, China uh, is not a clear adversary to quite a number of countries uh, around this region. Uh, we talk about China is a threat or opportunity. All we can really know, uh, maybe we cannot know. Uh, some countries even, uh, I mean, maybe some Indians say chi kind of a China threat, but I don't think China is a st structural threat uh, to many countries in this region. Um, but maybe uh, we talk about issue-based threat. For example, we, we, uh, we are seeing what happening along the border, unfortunately, but maybe that caused some kind of a threat perception among the Indians, or maybe some Chinese perceptions about Indians' uh, conduct uh, along the border. But anyway, uh, I don't think uh, China now is a kind of a structural threat. Um, and also, I think uh, Trump's American first policy or burden sharing or trade war with many his allies or partners in this region really put doubt among some countries in this region. How could uh, the U.S. new 
uh, let uh, alignment system can do? Or um, is that uh, a kind of a bending? We don't talk about the legal bending, they talk about bending uh, arrangement. Um, and also, I, I think um, countries in this region also have a kind, kind of a dilemma to choose from the uh, from China to, uh, I mean, taking side um, between China and the U.S. Um, and also uh, in this country um, have to uh, face a kind of a security dilemma uh, in those alignment system under uh, this alignment system. Uh, lastly, let me. Oh no, sorry. The third challenge, the reordinary, uh, re reordering of the global or regional regime or institutions. Uh, as I said, Trump's um, American first policy has undermined U.S. leadership in those institutions uh, over the last uh, uh, several years after he took power. And Trump's uh, victim uh, ident identity uh, and the shrinking leadership uh, uh, exhibition uh, in institutions uh, such as uh, WTO or um, WHO or even UN. Um, so we can say less interested uh, in those uh, organizations or institutions and also um, Trump's um, interest shrank, um, or no interest to provide public goods, which they normally say as a hegemon should provide. If they talk about the hegemonic uh, stability or hegemonic um, system, um, also they, they think China's growing influence has. Uh, witnessed uh, in those institutions uh, over the uh, the last decade, but China at the same time uh, is not uh, assuming the leadership, and maybe they they don't think uh, China has so far the enough capacity to take the lead. Uh, Maybe China is uh, taking more sh uh, sharing of the fund in different institutions. Uh, but I think uh, China's interest in taking the leadership role uh, is not ready yet. And I also think uh, in the institutions, um, the leaders, uh, among the institutions are not China-centric as uh, uh, Trump claimed because uh, it's a more multilateral arrangement. The employees or the, the officials uh, from different countries. Uh, I don't think China can really control what they are doing and what they should uh, do for the, uh, for the favor of China. The last um, challenge is anti-globalization and the common breaking of uh, China's uh, supply chain. Uh, I think uh, um, if we really take a closer look of the Chinese uh, companies or manufacturers um, after they r return back to the workplace, uh, maybe some of them, they could not uh, really got the job done because the demanding side of the um, the, uh, the the goods uh, have already shrinked. So, but that's a part of the story. But if you really take the uh, bigger picture, you can say maybe many countries during the during the pandemic they really think they maybe uh, even some fear. Uh, among those countries 
about the rely relies on Chinese medical products or supplying or emergent. Uh, so the, the the countries are now trying to um, to be more uh, self reliance uh, and also. Um, we talk about the restructuring the uh, global supply chain, um, including India. India uh, has already approached uh, to maybe over uh, 1,000 companies around the world, even uh, mo most of them maybe the US ones. Uh, talk about if uh, the manufacturers or companies uh, could uh, move to uh, India uh, from the US, uh, from China, and also Vietnam or other um, Southeast Asian countries are, are also tried hard to, uh, to move uh, some of the companies' uh, facilities uh, to their own countries. Um, but, I, I think of removing um, manufacturers uh, from China or other countries uh, are still, uh, I mean, a little bit far away from readiness because um, the, the supply chain around the, the manufacturers in China, uh, I mean, have already been there uh, 30 years from now. So if uh, one uh, manufacturer uh, or plant uh, moves to another country and you, you have to put uh, other supply chain ready for that manufacturer. I, I don't, I don't, I don't think, uh, think it's uh, not possible. I think it's very possible and I think uh, China should um, make clear is a kind of a trend and also has to take in steps uh, uh, to uh, adapt to the new reality. Now among the Chinese, we talk about uh, they, they, maybe in some day we have to uh, rely on our own consumptions, uh, domestic consumptions or uh, domestic uh, productions. Uh, but, they think it's a, they, they produce, they consume the, the products. Um, but I, as I said uh, earlier, uh, I think uh, it takes time to complete uh, the, the whole process. Uh, it really gives China some time to, uh, to re-engage or restructure his own, um, I mean, structure of the economy or different sectors uh, uh, in that economic arrangement. Um, so let me jump into the conclusion part. Uh, firstly, I would, uh, I would say global pandemic has accelerated uh, the existing shift of uh, balance of power and intensify the existing great power competition in a very dramatic way. Second, secondly, China had the first countries, um, as one of the first countries suffered, uh, the first country suffered the COVID-19 and one of them getting it controlled, has faced daunting challenges in his relationship with the outside world. Um, but with Chinese capacity and limited aspiration for a competing role with the United States, oh, uh, overestimate or oh, a kind of uh, anxiety over the Chinese uh, growing role or even uh, the stronger um, China uh, maybe putting more threat to other countries. I mean, that kind of uh, anxiety is not uh, necessary, at least uh, not uh, from now. And uh, sometimes the a little bit over uh, anxiety um, 
has a counterproductive uh, uh, effect. And that's what I want to share uh, with you some really um, plenary uh, thoughts about the Chinese foreign policy, uh, Chinese foreign relations uh, during the dynamic. Thank you very much for your uh, uh, attention and also I look forward to your comments and questions. And I'm sorry for the technical <laughs> inability <laughs> from my side. Actually, I prepared a, a PPT, but I couldn't put that uh, rapidly into my cell phone. Uh, I'm using the cell phone uh, for the room uh, co conference. So uh, if uh, somebody needs that, uh, I would love to share with you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Hanhua. Uh, I'm sure we will have you once again at some stage. China is going to continue to be of great interest uh, to all of us uh, in this platform and I think beyond this platform for a long period of time. Something that uh, Professor Hanhua may perhaps also enjoy knowing, as you closed your initial remarks, we had participants still at number 88, Papa. Papa is a lucky number for Chinese. <laughs> we had 88 right. participants as you concluded your uh, remarks. I have some names already with me. Uh, I also see that the questions have come in the text box, questions have come through email, but I have always said people who are with us, uh, you know, particularly those who I can see and that the speaker can see, uh, will get priority. I apologize if somebody is not happy with my way of functioning, uh, but speaker would like to see, uh, you know, who the person, uh, who are the people she's speaking to, who are people asking questions, uh, so let me not stand between, I think we always have had very intense uh, sort of question answer session. I'm sure this time again, I already have some names. I will start with uh, Dr. Monica Sethuraman, if she can hear me. Sir, uh, my question to ma'am was that initially she opened up with the bipolarity and multipolarity. So I would like to ask her, being Chinese, uh, which polarity does uh, China see as of suiting its aspirations, uh, fits into its aspirations? And also, uh, there is a lot of talk about the decoupling. Is there, uh, politically, I'm not going to ask her uh, about the political decoupling, but about the economic relationship. Uh, it's been anticipated since 2018 that there is going to be a bigger decoupling between China and the United States. But uh, even the trade war uh, did not see that much of decoupling and there is an interdependence on economic terms. So is there going to be a future, uh, you know, bigger decoupling which is being anticipated by many journalists today? Thank you. Okay, uh, thank you for your questions, uh, very important ones. Uh, I think uh, multipolar world, uh, I mean, since the end of the, the Cold War, China has already, uh, if you really, um, really observe the Chinese uh, narrative uh, about uh, what they describe uh, the world uh, is a multipolar world. And China has done quite a proactive uh, diplomacy to try to have a kind of multipolar world. India is um, among of the multipolar polars. I mean, but 1999, uh, maybe many of you uh, observed the um, bomb bombardment, uh, bombing of the, uh, the Chinese embassy in um, Yugoslavia at that time. And uh, at that time, China um, got kind of a, a weak uh, to say, oh, the world was not a really multipolar world. It's still uni unipolar world. But uh, now, uh, with the grow growing um, capability or other the growing influence uh, of China. Some people talk about uh, maybe uh, bi bipolar world, but uh, among the Chinese scholars, it's uh, very weird.
to see bipolar they talk about they still talk about the multipolar scenario mo mo most of them they talk about uh, but uh, even after the obama administration took power when obama visited beijing in 2009 uh, and proposed a kind of the g2 scenarios china uh, i mean politely <laughs> not not uh, officially declined but uh, a little bit hesitant to really take that kind of uh, concept uh decoupling of the economic uh i mean relationship between china and the us i think uh, um, more uh, feasibility would be as aspect uh, than mm, how to say <laughs> much than before during the pandemic um you, you know the first reaction during China, uh, only China was the only country suffer the COVID-19. At that time, the uh, commercial um, official, top uh, commercial official of uh, Trump administration, uh, Russ, uh, he said exactly. He said, "Oh, that that was a great opportunity to bring all the companies back to our own country." So they are doing that. They even put money or gave a benefit to the companies to go back and move back to, to uh, their home line. But the problem is that some of the big companies, uh, you, you know, Tesla, <laughs> um, the, the mask, uh, I, I, I think you, you know the, the, the car, fancy car <laughs> producer, Teresa. Uh, those and the other uh, oil companies or, or uh, big companies, they, they are still, uh, how to say, resisted to the appealing from the Trump administration officials to go back to, uh, to return back to, to their own country. So that, that's a kind of reality. I still think uh, the, the, from the official line, uh, coming back to the home line is a trend, trend tendency but in reality they still the the business is business they have to earn money right so it takes takes time at least uh, Odun Idris Toka is the next please uh, unmute yourself and uh, make your comment uh, I have question one question uh, yes. uh, to Professor Han China diplomatic offensive since April in the world especially in third world with what is now called uh, mask diplomacy? Is it a way to redeem or solidify relation with those countries? Is that your question? Yes. Uh, can, can, okay. I, can, I, can I get your question again? Sorry. Yes, I can tell you what he's asking. He's saying, is mass diplomacy of China, China uh -huh. way, China's way of redeeming its influence uh, with the whole world, or particularly these developed countries? Oh, oh, okay. Thank you. Uh, now, I, I answer that now. Professor Yeah. Um, it's a very interesting question. Uh, uh, I think um, the Chinese uh, national identity is not uh, really clear uh, enough now. Uh, you, you can say the contradictions. Uh, how the Chinese see themselves, uh, what the identity uh, they belong to, uh, they, they belong to. Um, they, they still think um, as, a, as a country as a whole, uh, China's uh, GDP is the second largest. So it's not a develop, de developing country in that sense. And that most uh, more powerful, but still, if you really, uh, to go to China, especially the countryside, you, you know, uh, this year is a kind of, uh, uh, I, I don't know if you, you know that or not, uh, Xi Jinping's um, requirement for the, or the, the, how to say, the government requirement for this year is to get rid of the uh, poverty. Uh, sorry, it's a poverty, right? 
yeah, it's a poverty. This year is the last year okay. because every every um, officials uh, in the um, how to say the local level they have to go uh, to into the small villages. They have to help the local people to to develop their economy or uh, to get rid of the the po poverty, right? Um, so in that sense, yeah. Can I Question was about China's mask diplomacy. China is supplying masks and medical materials and work. Oh, 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 I'm sorry. <laughs> Sorry, I nice. thought uh, you're talking about the developing country or not. Okay, sorry. <laughs> uh, actually, um, I think if you talk about the, the Max, uh, face Max uh, diplomacy, uh, you, you, you really can get some uh, emotional reactions from the Chinese because uh, many Chinese, you, if you really uh, Get on the internet, you can see the countries talk about, oh, we are trying, because China has the capability to produce enough number of um, masks for uh, different countries. So they suffer some kind of risks, take some risks uh, to produce or the produce the, the masks and then sent out to different countries. But later on, they got blamed and uh, either maybe the quality issue, quality problem, or they, they some people think uh, China is taking mask diplomacy as a tool to gain some kind of influence or political goals. That that's, uh, make some Chinese feel sad because um, uh, whatever they do, no, no matter what, how to say, what, Whatever they do, uh, whenever they do, they do wrong. Uh, really, is a kind of a, how to say, a kind of a global pandemic uh, uh, outcome uh, for the Chinese uh, diplomacy or foreign policy, uh, foreign relations. I'll ask next Ambassador Ashok Sajanha. Uh, please, sir, the floor is yours. Unmute yourself. Uh, thank you very much, uh, first of all, Professor Swaran Singh and Professor Reena Marwa for organizing this excellent presentation. And also a very big uh, thank you to you, Professor Hanupa, for this uh, very patient and very elaborate uh, uh, exposition of the challenges that uh, China faces at this time when it is getting of COVID-19 and countries are still battling with it. Uh, you know, uh, I have one or two comments and then one or two questions, uh, if you permit, uh, Professor Swan Singh. The uh, first comment is, you know, meaning the title of this uh, presentation was, Is China Under Siege? So I think that, uh, 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 Professor Hanwa, you didn't give a direct response. Uh, is it a yes? Is it a no? Is it a maybe? And I would like to uh, submit for your consideration, Madam, that, uh, you know, as it is said in India, also around the world, that if there was uh, no, there cannot be any smoke without fire. So if we are discussing this issue, that means it's a very live issue. It's a very, uh, uh, it's a very uh, issue that is occupying the mind of a large number of people. And uh, one particular evidence from this would be that at the World Health Assembly meeting on the 18th of uh, last month, uh, while all other countries were represented by their health ministers, it was only China which had its president coming in because uh, you could see that there were about 130 countries which had got together in a tabling, co-sponsoring a resolution which said that there should be an independent, impartial, and comprehensive investigation into the origins of uh, uh, COVID-19. So uh, these uh, are uh, one or two comments. Another is, Madam, you said that uh, in 2009, uh, China was 30% of the US uh, economy. Today, it is 66%, and you also gave comparisons with Japan. 
but would you also not acknowledge and accept that much of Chinese uh, GDP growth and prosperity over all these years has been as a result of uh, its exports and its uh, economic and trade engagement with the United States? Meaning we saw that US-China trade war was going on. And at one time, it was about uh, China had a trade surplus of 419 billion US dollars with uh, the United States. So the United States has had an important role to play. I would say that even India, we have had about $60 billion of trade deficit, over much uh, uh, smaller bilateral trade turnover. So I think China has been able to grow as a result of its engagement with these countries, and maybe it would be useful if it would be mindful of these uh, uh, facts also. The second point is you said uh, that uh, different countries, and particularly I think it is uh, basically the United States, Mr. Trump and uh, uh, his officials, Mr. Pompeo, they speak about the Chinese virus or Wuhan virus. You have said that uh, nothing can be established uh, without a scientific uh, uh, fact-finding research. But when countries ask for such a fact-finding research, then you, uh, China puts its foot down. I don't want to go into the details of how China reacted or responded to when uh, Australia asked for, uh, and it's said in due course, and it's basically because we do not want a similar pandemic happening in the future. So, but that also, I will not go into the sort of, you know, the rather intemperate and the abusive language that was used by, uh, you know, some of the Chinese uh, officials and diplomats. Uh, my question, Madam, to you is, you have mentioned these four challenges uh, that uh, uh, China faces. Now, how do you feel? Has uh, China conducted itself uh, creditably in dealing with these challenges over the last two, three months uh, that, uh, uh, you know, all these issues have been with us? Particularly in the context of, uh, you know, what is known as uh, the use of wolf warrior diplomats. I'm sure you are uh, very familiar with that uh, concept. And uh, I think they are called uh, diplomats, but having been a diplomat myself, I can say that uh, their uh, uh, behavior, attitude, and use of words is anything but uh, diplomatic. And uh, maybe it is, uh, you know, China is asserting itself and uh, it uh, feels this is the only way. But maybe there could be your response whether this is a good way. The last question, madam, is on relations with India. And that I uh, want to submit to you, that India has always been extremely sensitive to Chinese concerns. Where our uh, own uh, uh, core interests are in, uh, involved, let's say in the China-Pakistan economic corridor, we have made it clear. But otherwise, when the world has been speaking out against uh, the incarceration of uh, Muslims and Uyghurs in Xinjiang, China has, uh, India has not joined in uh, that, uh, uh, in that uh, commentary. When the world has spoken about Hong Kong, India has kept quiet. About Taiwan, India has uh, been, South China Sea, when, you, when China sinks a Vietnamese trawler, et cetera, et cetera, and all the other things, India has been quiet. The trade deficit, huge trade deficit that I referred to, uh, that also uh, has been a problem. Now, I find that China is not at all sensitive to India's uh, uh, requirements, concerns, sensitivities, whether it is a membership of the nuclear suppliers group, which is a good thing, I think, for the world. China is the only country which stands in the way. India's membership of the UN Security Council, China blocks it. India's trade deficit, and so many other things that support to Pakistan to beef it up against India. So would you like to consider that China could be a little more, considerably more sensitive to India's concerns for uh, our relations to get better? And you see what is happening in the, uh, on the Tibet border, on the uh, Ladakh border. And I think that does not uh, bode very well for smooth uh, uh, development of our bilateral ties. Thank you very much. Thank you. Professor Hanho?
Thank you very much, uh, Ambassador. Uh, and thank you. I, I really appreciate your comments and also those questions. Because, um, I mean, as a professor at university uh, and also a scholar on uh, I mean, South Asia, uh, those questions uh, come uh, appear to me uh, from time to time uh, and really make me to think um, what we can really learn from the Indian's perspective. And also, um, you, you have, um, uh, Ambassador, you have uh, so much uh, the first hand uh, uh, diplomatic um, I mean, experience. I, I really appreciate your comments. Uh, you make uh, uh, me think. Um, the first question you, you, you talk about uh, WHO's, uh, I mean, um, if I am correctly understood to your question, you talk about uh, only Xi Jinping is the president rather than the ministers. Um, ministers. Um, I mean, actually, Adam, that was just a comment. That was a comment, not a question. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay. Okay. Maybe but but anyway, I. Yeah, I, I just want to to say um, some people in the beginning um, doubt, uh, put doubt about China, if China would uh, like to um, endorse uh, the, the investigation proposal uh, or not. But later on, they realized uh, you know, China uh, was, um, I mean, I mean, proactively uh, uh, engage in that uh, discussion or dialogue and then to join that that rather us uh, did not uh, join that so that that that's a comment i i want to make uh, the second one you you talk about uh, um the warrior uh narrative uh, among the chinese uh, diplom diplomats i think uh, that's uh, really uh, also causes some some kind of debate uh, among the chinese uh also, the, the scholars, uh, I mean, what kind of approach? They, they have to deal with the maximum pressure from the Trump administration. Whenever you really uh, talk about uh, uh, the high level uh, diplomat, maybe the top, top level, uh, top diplomat in that country, Mr. Pompeo also always talk about the Wuhan virus really make the Chinese feel like uh, hurt. Uh, but I still think uh, as diplomats, uh, I think uh, uh, especially from the Chinese uh, diplomats, normally they had a kind of a very polite, very mild uh, response to different uh, criticism. But uh, this time I, I, I feel the, the feeling among the Chinese uh, diplomats they they got uh, anger, especially when you talk about uh, something untruth uh, and and I mean I'm not talking about the truth, talking about the allegation or um, that that kind of thing. Uh, so uh, even um, I think uh, the warriors. Uh, propaganda or you, you can use uh, propaganda um, words really make the Chinese uh, nationalism more uh, in, on the clean up uh, direction. That's not uh, really, I mean, good because we still need, even under the sage, <laughs> we still think uh, rational thinking is important to keep the, uh, the relationship no, no matter with the United States and the Oh, uh, either and uh, with India should be, uh, how to say, on the base, uh, basic uh, rational uh, judgment rather than the sentiment or nationalist uh, assessments. Uh, that, that's really uh, what I mean. But uh, the, the last one is about uh, Chinese relationship with India. Uh, that's right. I, I think um, since 1990s, uh, um, I mean, because I have been involved in different uh, levels of uh, dialogues or um, seminars or uh, conferences, I always uh, heard uh, the Indians' uh, counterparts or researchers talking about the China's lack of uh, the sensitivity to, China, uh, to Indians' uh, uh, concerns. Um, 
I, I think, uh, as far as I know, I think uh, now uh, among the Chinese scholars, they talk about the sensitivity, at least they talk about the sensitivity. Uh, I think uh, uh, some changes have already been seen uh, in, that, in such kind, um, because whenever they think maybe it's a, some, some issues appear on the table related to the core interests of the uh, of Indians interest we have to uh, how to say to deal with that uh, in a very cautious way um, even now with the BIR uh, BRI um, I mean they, they know some Indians uh, they, they think maybe China from the beginning uh, China should of uh, the leader uh, got some kind of a uh, communications or with uh, in, uh, um, Indians counterparts then uh, China um, how to say uh, initiate that that uh, kind of proposal to the world so um, I think that that's uh, another case I, I think um, some other leaders uh, later on they think uh, they have to to Put that issues on the on the table, and then we find some kind of a solution or some kind of understanding between these two countries. Uh, I, I I don't I'm not saying we are done enough job uh, in that sense, but I just uh, but we we have already taken into consideration, uh, and also I think that. From the Chinese part, we also think uh, the same uh, question uh, to or uh, the Indian counterparts. And um, sometimes we, we think it is a kind of a reciprocal uh, practice. Uh, Indian also needs to uh, take a Chinese, uh, how to say, sensitivity into India's uh, consideration. Okay, thank you. I think we should move to the next question. And I have a very dear friends uh, who have requested for time. Please bear with us, have patience. We'll take every question. Next, I'm requesting now Subhavid Kyokong. Are you with us? Uh, Subhavid, please unmute yourself and uh, make your comment or raise your question. Uh, I, thank you for Professor Mohan. I have some questions about the uh, Chinese. Dip, dip. Diplomacy. Yeah. Do you think Chinese diplomacy approach has changed, which was, uh, which is known as like the Joe Ally style? If yes, what is the reason behind the change? If not, why the out, I mean the other country look China is more aggressive toward the other country. For example, in the South China Sea, or in the Indian Ocean. Yeah, is what my question. Okay, I think uh, you got the question, Professor Hanma. Yeah, uh, no, not, not exactly. You, you talk about Zhou Enlai's style uh, diplomacy. Yeah. Yeah. Do, you, do you think China is move, move out from this style of uh, diplomacy? Oh, oh, okay. Um, Zhou Enlai's, uh, I mean, diplomacy, that style really was uh, well received uh, by many countries like, uh, um, I mean, Japan, India, uh, Pakistan, and also other countries. Uh, I mean, I think uh, if you talk about uh, uh, John Lai's uh, um, diplomacy, I think one uh, striking characteristic is uh, they, they, they cooperate uh, they, they, they try to find common interests, but with a dispute. But uh, they, they are great uh, countries are different, uh, different, and have a different uh, ideology, uh, different ideologies and uh, regimes. So, so that that kind of uh, uh, journalized uh, diplomacy. That's a uh, one character. The other one is. Uh, 
coexistence, um, peaceful coexistence, right? So, uh, so far, uh, I think uh, people talk about uh, uh, China is trying to get rid of the Tao Guang Yang Hui. That is a light low or low profile posture uh, in his, uh, his uh, diplomacy. Um, some people suggest that China should uh, go back to the Tao Guang Yang Hui period of uh, diplomacy. That kind of a di diplomacy to deal, to assure uh, the neighbors or to assure uh, other countries um, they can cooperate, they can deal with uh, uh, disputes uh, with a uh, more diplomatic way rather than the show, ma uh, show mas musculars. Uh, um, but uh, so, I mean, nowadays uh, people talk about um, they, they lie low or they, they have uh, a kind of a low profile diplomacy or reassured uh, diplomacy. That means they have, uh, uh, they, they don't have to, uh, let me put it uh, the other way. Uh, I mean, chi the, the Chinese uh, actually wanted so much about, uh, they have a kind of, a, they call it a strategic opportunity, which means they can continue to develop our economy and uh, don't don't uh, interfere uh, not interfere uh, not not uh, really engage in so uh, military um, I mean confrontations with other countries uh, but uh, in recent days uh, in recent uh, years uh, the, the Chinese uh, seemingly um, lost the hope because they feel uh, the very uh, striking different uh, uh, security environment uh, China is facing, especially the pressure from the US uh, has been so escalated and they have to think, uh, you, using Xi Jinping's word, the bottom line thinking. The bottom line thinking means they have to take uh, the worst scenario uh, scenario to to in in our uh, serious consideration because we maybe someday uh, the military halt conflict uh, will will occur even China does not want to engage in the hot military confrontation with especially I mean. <laughs> especially now because um, we, we still think that China is not ready yet to to be a what we call the welfare state <laughs> in the middle of uh, this uh, century. Okay, um, thanks. Professor Hanwha, uh, basically I think uh, you're saying that China has changed now and in the new China uh, there has to be certain amount of uh, evolution in the style and substance of uh, Chinese diplomacy. Uh, can I ask next, uh, Professor Kin Mong So, to please unmute yourself and uh, make your remark. Please, Professor So. Sir, sir, can you hear me? Yes. Thank you, thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much uh, for the opportunity. Uh, I have two questions to uh, Madam uh, Hua. The f uh, first question is, uh, uh, how China scholar accept the Dan Fu Fan, the older son of the late Chinese leader Deng Xiaofeng, advice to the Chinese government? He said, and I quote, keep a sober mind and know it please, delivering a counterpoint to Beijing increasingly ambitious foreign policy and military assertive, assertiveness. Uh, uh, how a uh, Chinese scholar accepts on this uh, Dan Fu Fan advice to the uh, Chinese uh, government. Uh, my second question is, uh, what do uh, Madam uh, Hua think of the best idea or solution for China and India and Myanmar to work and grow together for the realization of the 
21st century as the Asian century. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Uh, if, if I remember correctly, uh, in October last year, the South uh, China Morning Post uh, uh, report a very interesting article about uh, uh, Deng Fufen, uh, who is the son of the great Chinese leader Deng Xiaoping, and he advised the Chinese government not to be very ambitious, uh, not to be very aggressive uh, for the uh, foreign policy and military assertiveness. Uh, my question is, how do Chinese uh, experts accept on uh, Dan Fufen advice to Chinese uh, government? Um, I, I think uh, the premier uh, leader of China, uh, Deng Xiaoping, or other leaders also um, suggest that China uh, have a very low profile and I mean just uh, don't be so <laughs> as you said uh, assertive uh, in dealing with other countries um, I, I think uh, that basically is a Chinese uh, culture uh, it's not uh, I mean assertiveness is not uh, the Chinese culture way because we talk about uh, Wei Qi uh, is uh, according to uh, uh, Kissinger. Kissinger, um, or, uh, if you read uh, his uh, book on on China, the, the title is on China. You, uh, he started to talk about China. He used the Wei Qi. I don't know how to say in English. Maybe it's a chess. Uh, it's not an English chess, but it's an Asian chess. Uh, they talk about Wei Qi. Wei Qi means uh, uh, if the uh, if the how to say uh, the other player uh, to get uh, occupied a peer of uh, your your territory, uh, you you don't have to fight back is uh, immediately and uh, how to say got clash uh, with uh, with the other player rather you you can how to say temporarily maybe you, you don't need to take a very uh, confrontational approach you just uh, how to say establish a kind of uh, um how, how to say surrounding uh, to take a uh, took a very resilient way to get strength, growth uh, in this uh, confrontational chess. Uh, you don't have to immediately uh, to fight back, but you, that, that's the way that the Chinese approach, approach normally has. But as you said, maybe now uh, China is uh, showing the world more uh, aspirational and also maybe more assertive. Uh, assertive. Uh, but for some, uh, for some Chinese, we also think uh, maybe uh, the, the time is not, it's not uh, good for China to, to be so assertive uh, to pursue his rights or to, uh, to maintain his uh, uh, Territory integrity in South China Sea or in other places. So uh, that that is uh, still in the debate because we talk about uh, if we need to uh, Tao Guang Yang Hui's approach or a Lai Lao approach or the Yu Suo Zuo Wei. I don't know how to say it, more proactive or more assertive uh, approach. That that's uh, still going on, but uh, I, I think uh, under the pasture. More, more harsh uh, or deteriorated uh, security environment. Maybe that that part is more gaining more um, public than the low like uh, low profile the diplomacy. Thank you. That that that's a kind of a balance. Thank you. Uh, I'm now beginning to look at the clock uh, because we have only crossed the allocated time. Uh, we are one uh, three minutes beyond one o'clock. But uh, we have usually allowed questions to continue as long as the participants are willing to stay with us. 
we don't think we have a choice. We continue to stay with you as long as you want us to stay with you. The next, uh, I'm requesting uh, Professor Srimati Chakravarti if she's still with us. Thank you, Swaran. Uh, can I be heard? Yes. Okay. Uh, Professor Hanwa, uh, last week when I saw you on the screen, I remembered that some 10 years back uh, we had met. I think on behalf of ICS, we had invited you and uh, we uh, had a uh, we, we heard you at a conference and then again uh, this time Marina and Swaran have brought us face to face even though it's virtual anyway my well you, you made a very good presentation I was very insightful learned a lot however my question is that some observers believe that uh, this uh, anti-china rhetoric in the US and uh, all other, uh, you know, uh, anti-China feelings, etc., uh, will continue till the elections in the United States. Till Trump uh, has his elections, he will continue with that. And uh, whether he wins or loses, after the U.S. elections, things will become relatively moderate. I just want to hear your view on that. How is it? How much is it connected with the U.S. elections? Um, professor, I think you, you raise a very important uh, question because I, I should have done that uh, in my presentation because I, I think uh, that's important uh, for the Chinese uh, um, analysts or the decision um, makers. They, they have to think about or oh, identify what the difference between the current, uh, I mean, um, post uh, uh, November <laughs> say no American relations all the the during the champion uh, how how we deal with the difference that that's very important otherwise we we cannot uh, really take the rational uh, assessment to the uh, to the situation um, uh, I think so I, I think uh, so far because the US in the US the rhetoric, uh, if you really read the memo uh, coming from uh, the White House, the uh, the uh, Republic uh, Republican Party memo very clearly talk about uh, the officials or the party members. They have to whatever they 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 face the the problems they are whatever the the public. Uh, the problems are just to link them to China. And they think both uh, partition, uh, by partition, con um, con uh, conscious, uh, no, sorry, um, partition, uh, by partition, uh, common, common interest. Yeah, yeah, consensus. Yeah, consensus is um, no matter who will uh, rule the country, uh, China is the main challenger to the U.S. And the, the Chinese, uh, um, uh, the U.S. approach toward China is no longer could be returned back to uh, to before 1990s because they think. Uh, there, uh, the old approach, uh, which tried to bring China into the international community, community, and to put China in a proper, I mean, position in the suppliers' chain, no challenging the U.S. Uh, position or the the hegemonic uh, position, and that that that's normally. They, they think uh, the old approach, but it did not work. So now, no matter who the party is in the White House, the, the approach toward China cannot be changed that dramatically. Uh, but as you said, the, the, during the champion, the rhetoric, anti-China rhetoric, will be really mounting among the people uh, as a as a whole, so the nationalists, the netizens, they all have a kind of a bad 
perception against China. For example, if I really read the character uh, statistics, talking about the perception, I think now more than 70% uh, the bad perception about China, about the Chinese. So if you really, from that perspective, I think the champion, uh, even if it's a goal, uh, it goes away, but the sentiment, especially among the, the mass or public, uh, public mass, uh, I think uh, um, in terms of uh, nationalism or anti-Chinese uh, sentiments uh, will uh, preserved. Thank you. Uh, I will next request now uh, Professor Vijay Kumar uh, Barunwal. Please unmute yourself and uh, make your comments. Sir. To begin it, I'd like to thank uh, Professor Hanhua for such a wonderful lecture and giving her views about uh, Chinese views, China's views on her on its relations with other countries of the world. Uh, but I still wonder on certain issues. Uh, you see, India and China are two great civilizations and had never had uh, bad relations, I would say, except for 1962. So we had wonderful uh, relations in the past. And I feel there's no reason why two, these two large countries of Asia cannot coexist. Now I come to my, the, the question that you see, China has resolved its border issues with most of the neighbors, except India. So what is the reason that China keeps the border issue live with India, whereas China's interest is, should be to keep India on its side? Thank you very much. Yes, um, border issue uh, is here now. Uh, I think... Um, the two civilizations, uh, there's no doubt. I, I think uh, from a civilization point of view, I think the two peoples uh, appreciate each other. And I think uh, back in the ancient history, China learned uh, too, uh, really much about uh, uh, from India. Uh, if you really um, look at the... Uh, the, the Buddhism or other uh, religion, religions or um, the communication from the religious perspective. Uh, you, you really appreciate uh, the civilization um, linked the two, two countries together. And then that's why I think uh, some people proposed uh, the Qin, Qinda, um, Qinda. Uh, mm -hmm. That, that, that's uh, exactly, we talk about the civilization is the base. We can co re, uh, coexist uh, exist, uh, each other. But uh, talking about the, the border issue, it, you talk about the uh, Indian-China uh, border is the last uh, the disputed uh, border uh, along the Chinese border. Uh, I, I think... Um, because I, I teach uh, the course to the students uh, again, again, again about the border issue. And the students also very curious about uh, why uh, only India uh, still not, uh, how to say, India and China could not, uh, so far cannot uh, solve that problem. Um, they, they called Sometimes I, I call it India-China uh, border is uh, Ding Zihu, this version. Ding Zihu uh, means the, the last one and very difficult. So, so only Bhutan and India, um, they, they could not uh, get uh, a resolution uh, or settlement. Um, why? I, I think maybe uh, because um, for, or nationalism in both countries or uh, other issues like uh, growing uh, 
growing as for regions uh, between these two countries to, to have an influence uh, in Asia. All kinds of um, maybe factors uh, really uh, bring these two countries apart, um, not, not really together to solve that problem. I, I, I really think uh, the, the border issue uh, is uh, so difficult uh, for, for China, at least uh, from my perspective, is if they, they actually, let, let, let me put that way. I mean, John Lai, um, some um, participant mentioned the John Lai. We talk about John Lai. We talk about uh, some kind of John Lai's uh, proposal to solve the, the border issue. But that, that kind of uh, exchange uh, may, may be, um, they, they call the mutual accommodation approach or principle-based uh, resolution. It's gone away. Uh, I, I don't know why. They, they cannot uh, say again, they, they, they take uh, the west part, you take the, the east part. It's that, that kind of, uh, how to say, Chinese uh, uh, wants a proposal. It's not as, has not accepted by the Indian part and the Chinese. Uh, say, oh, you, you lost uh, two opportunities to talk about uh, that kind of arrangement. So what we can do? That, that's, uh, I, I, I really don't know. But uh, let, let me, um, how to say, uh, say one word. I mean, territory for both sides uh, are not, um, it's a very symbolic uh, of the so sovereignty. So sovereignty is uh, difficult to deal with. And to the solve the, uh, solving the, the di very difficult uh, um, dispute uh, needs the strong consensus or that, that's uh, what we have to, to do before we solve that problem. And requesting Dr. Chandra Bhushan Nagar to please unmute yourself and make your intervention, please. Yeah, I am audible. Yes. Hello. Okay, thank you so much, sir, for giving opportunity. Uh, a very good afternoon to everyone. Uh, my brief question for Professor Hanua is like, uh, is China a believer of the policy of opportunism, especially when we talk about Myanmar and Bhutan? Why? I just want to refer to one of the recent article published in Asia Times written by a Swedish journalist Bertin Linter. He argued that uh, if we see the China's approach towards Myanmar, when China, you know, was uh, at the back, China, who, you know, again, move backward because problem was that China wanted that the West should, you know, kept aside. And later on, when we see the influx of Rohingya crisis in Myanmar, again, West, you know, put such Myanmar under siege. And that time, China took it as an opportunity to again come back into Myanmar and started expanding its burdens. Now, my brief question is like, uh, is China using uh, these kind of, you know, or, you know, opportunities to expand itself in this, uh, the countries like Myanmar? I mean, I just want uh, a brief comment from Professor Han Hua, like how she, you know, analyzed this policy of China. Uh, okay. Um, for me, I think it's a kind of a trilateral, uh, I mean, diplomacy. Uh, maybe... Uh, before uh, 1990s, I think China uh, was working so hard, uh, inward uh, looking and uh, did something for their economic, economic growth. So at that time, China's, uh, I mean, relationship or influence did not uh, expand it uh, uh, into his uh, really the neighbors on that uh, west, southwest uh, flank, flank, flank. Um, but uh, with the uh, the Chinese uh, economic uh, growth, and also, uh, uh, I mean, in in 1990s, or oh, in 1980s or 1990s, we still think um, at that time China's. Uh, uh, foreign policy was guided by the principle of light law. Let, let us uh, develop the, our economy 
just uh, how to say make sure they have uh, they had a kind of a peaceful environment that that's enough the the, the uh, priority for for china was to develop uh, the economic growth, uh, economy um but uh, with the the chinese uh, economic uh, interest uh, expanded uh, and also china's uh, i mean the going out uh, strategy or policy and um, they, they the the chinese identity uh, used to be oh we are a kind of a east asian state uh, our identity belongs to east asia um but uh, west asia or central asia or uh, the north uh, east asia um the identity was not was not uh, clearly i mean at that time but with the growth of china china feel like uh, oh uh they they are a uh, asian country maybe they are in the middle of asia because we we border with uh, different uh, countries along our border if they talk about uh, south asia north uh, southeast asia and th th those countries are also chinese neighbors and uh, with those uh, developments i i think uh, i I don't think it's a very sudden way, but uh, China's interest is bounded to Myanmar and Bhutan. And also, I, I think, uh, um, for example, Myanmar. Myanmar, what we have done is uh, basically economic driven. Uh, for example, we, we try to uh, help or assist uh, the build up of the dams or other um, infrastructure but uh, suddenly they think uh, maybe w whenever the chinese uh, projects uh, approaches where have some problem <laughs> sometimes an environmental problem sometimes uh, how to say ethnic um, uh, and unrest or some other um, problems so that 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 is uh, what uh, i what they think uh, maybe BIR really put uh, all the, the issues back into the Chinese decision-making consideration. So a sense of uh, political se uh, security is going up in the decision-making process. So Myanmar uh, is not uh, opportunism. I, I think uh, it's not opportunism. It's a kind of a natural expansion of Chinese interest. I don't think so far China has done that too much uh, about the military engagement with uh, Myanmar. We uh, know Cook Island now is uh, in the consideration of uh, India's uh, collaboration with Myanmar, right? Um, but but um, I, um, I, because I, I did the research on the, um, on the 1990s uh, China Burma relationship, I know uh, what's, what was going on after the, the military um, uh, regime uh, took power in that country. Uh, and uh, how the sense evolved, evolved in, in, I mean, but now uh, after the democratic uh, uh, elected, uh, um, I mean, government there, but since the improvement of the uh, Chinese uh, and uh, the Aung San Suu Kyi's uh, go uh, government have improved, but at this juncture, problem like a refugee or others, um, I mean, occurred. We have to, how to say, take a the second thought of what what our policy uh, is and should we continue in that the direction or we need to to adapt a new reality to make a new approach, more more engagement, but with uh, more. As as the uh, ambassador said, the uh, sensitivity to uh, take uh, other countries like Indians' uh, security sensitivity uh, into our policy making consideration. 
Is Dr. Satendra Upadhyay still with us? Yes, please, sir. Yes, please unmute and uh, yes, raise your question. Please. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank you, sir. And uh, thank you, Hanfa, uh, for the nice talk about that. My question is uh, related to the China foreign policy, you can say, with a shared future for the mankind. And I was referring to the China foreign minister uh, address to the, the BRICS meeting for on 28 April. So when it talked about like, you know, the fight against the COVID-19 on the global perspective and support to the African and all those. So my question to Hanfa is that, uh, is that the healthcare diplomacy is going to be one of the additional aspect in the shared future uh, policy of the China? Yes, uh, I, I think uh, the, the health uh, diplomacy or the, based on the, uh, they call this uh, global uh, public uh, health uh, diplomacy, really a new perspective uh, in Chinese uh, diplomacy. Because so far, I, I have uh, participated or involved in some kind of a discussion or dialogue with other countries in terms of uh, the, the public policy, uh, public uh, um, health uh, governance, global governance. So that that's uh, really important. Uh, under the pandemic, uh, makes it even further the the importance in terms of the importance. So I definitely agree with you. We have to we we have to take that uh, for our shared future. But how? I I think uh, India has a very um, as far as uh, many Chinese and also they, they think uh, they, they can learn each other. Uh, India has a very good, uh, um, I mean, public uh, health, uh, healthy uh, oh, uh, medicine, medicine treatment uh, regime, right? Uh, can, I, can I use that term? Yes. Um, yeah, b because we, we talk about especially the poor people, grassroots people, they can get, get uh, e treat, uh, treatment, uh, medical treatment uh, easily uh, in, uh, in India. But in China, now, uh, if people, ordinary people, gr grocery, uh, like, uh, <laughs> sorry, uh, is the low income people, if they go to the hos hospitals, they have to, how to say, sometimes they cannot afford it. Um, they have to learn from India in that sense because they still uh, feel like uh, the health insurance or other, the treatment in the countryside uh, are not uh, so developed. Uh, so it's, it's expensive for the ordinary uh, people. So how they can really learn the, the experience uh, from India. Um, that there's some good uh, topics uh, could uh, appear on our um, our communication channels. I mean, they, they can exchange our views on on those. Thanks. It's a it's a very very important uh, um, how to say um, good topic uh, for uh, strengthening. Uh, our bilateral relations. Thank you. I'm sorry. I have to almost now push because we are crossing all earlier uh, records that we have made. I'll request Subro, Subro Paroi if uh, he's with us. Yes. Uh, thank you, Professor Halwa, for your insights. It's just a question that uh, since the US has decided that cuts for them, that will be a uh, opportunity for China to take a lead role in the world health sector. Uh, the, the line was not so so good. So let me repeat your, your question. Do, do you mean um, as, as US now is declining, China should uh, take the leadership? Yes. Lead role. Oh. yes, yes. Oh, okay. In health. Um, yeah, I, I think uh, especially from the pandemic uh, episode, I, I think um, the, the Chinese expert 
region. They, they know our, uh, they have a limit uh, capacity to assume the leadership or the, even the, how to say, the leading role in the global affairs. Because um, for, for me, I think the, um, from the narrative about uh, who are responsible for the pandemic or who should uh, pay more for the, uh, for the loss of uh, different countries. I, I got a sense of uh, inability uh, for the Chinese, at least uh, from the perspective of a narrative. Uh, in Chinese word, they call Hua Yu Quan. Hua Yu Quan is a very important factor for a country to take a lead. Because whatever the, the narrative, uh, I mean, uh, unfolded, the country's reputation, the country's image, maybe will strengthen or weak, weakened. But this, this pandemic made me feel like uh, the, the Chinese, even the Chinese has done, I mean, his role, try to find uh, his, uh, because he's uh, getting, uh, getting the pandemic, uh, uh, the, the, <laughs> the COVID-19 under control a little bit, not completely because so far, the students are not coming back on the campus. Even the graduating, uh, students can come back in the in, in nice. I mean, active actually nice week. Uh, group one group from another. They were returning back to the campus. So the situation uh, is not uh, completely under control yet. But uh, I mean, China w wanted to to do something uh, because. The, uh, China received uh, so many um, good, well, uh, assistance from other countries during the Chinese lonely, <laughs> lonely suffering the, the pandemic at that time. Um, but but uh, wh what China has done uh, has been described like uh, taking advantage of, uh, how to say, geopolitical gains or whatever. But from that part I, I think uh, china is far away from the uh, the the leading role or the the key role uh, the the first role thank you so much uh, i still continue seeing requests coming from dr gursangeet barat and dr sukhir barat if they are with us they are still welcome to are you with us please if you are please raise your voice Otherwise, I'll give the last intervention of the day to my senior colleague from Delhi University, Professor Nirmal Jindal. Professor Jindal, please. Um, thank you very much, Professor Suran Singh. Uh, I congratulate you for organizing this webinar. And thank you, Professor uh, Hua Han, <laughs> for such a wonderful talk and for giving the Chinese perspective you know, on the world order and uh, Chinese threat perception and foreign policy. So, uh, as you have mentioned that uh, China is not ready for the global leadership as yet. Uh, China is not interested in structural changes or China is not interested in any kind of military confrontation. But, you know, uh, uh, being uh, an Indian and sitting in this part of the world, uh, you know, we feel that uh, during the pandemic period, uh, Chinese, uh, China has indulged in some kind of unharmonious relationship with uh, some of its neighboring countries, including India. And it seems that China's uh, behavior appears to be uh, quite incompatible with the essence of globalization. And, uh, it seems that China is trying to undermine the uh, existing uh, global order and uh, this threat perception of Chinese neighboring countries is pushing them towards United States of America. 
So I just want to see uh, that uh, what is, how do you perceive that? What is the real intent of China? If China is not interested in any of the confrontations or, so what is, is it just uh, pressure tactics or coercive diplomacy? I mean, how you perceive India in uh, China's threat perception, like uh, India perceives China as a, you know, major factor in its threat perception. Thank you. Professor Hanho, this is the last question. So in case you wish to make any concluding remarks. Okay. Um, thank you very much for your, your question. Um, again, I think um, it's a very re relevant uh, question and also important one. Uh, I, I think um, during the pandemic, actually, uh, I mean, comparatively speaking, uh, to be frank, to be frank, I mean, many Chinese, you even include uh, some of my relatives, they, they, they told me <clears throat> why India did not do something like uh, Japan during the dynamic pandemic, because uh, uh, the Japan had uh, some conflicting, uh, I mean, dispute with China in terms of Diao Yu Dao or Diao Yu Island or some other issues. But during the, the pandemic, uh, Japan uh, is, a, is a very interesting story because uh, many Chinese, uh, we talk about uh, the, the closeness of the cultures uh, between China and Japan because China, Japan um, sent um, masks or other uh, health um, medicine equipment to to China um, during China um, the very peak uh, pandemic period of time. Uh, at that time, um, the the uh, the Japanese uh, write the Chinese uh, uh, the ancient poem. Uh, how, how to say that? Yeah, uh, say um, like like uh, they share. Um, even they, they have a uh, different mountains and rivers, but uh, they share one moon, something like that. Uh, and uh, that really made the Chi Chinese feel. Even Chi even Chinese talk about the anti-Japanese movement or wh whatever. Um, it's hard to to imagine how the Chinese responds uh, very favorably about uh, that kind of assistance. So we expected uh, India maybe among other countries uh, um, were doing something like that, but uh, it turned out to be India is among the first countries uh, who declared they, are, they were not going to, uh, how to say, light as part of our cotton or whatever. And also people talk too much during the pandemic about uh, the, the, <laughs> the shipment uh, detained uh, along the Indian border. So, so, so many uh, not very happy uh, happened. But uh, later on, the Chinese uh, perception uh, on India changed a little bit uh, when the Indians also sent uh, um, other equipment or the uh, the mask uh, to 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 China, so that that's I, I saw the very um, subtle um, difference uh, during the pandemic how the Chinese uh, uh, perceive uh, Indians' uh, help. So uh, I I I have hoped um, those kind of uh, very heartwarming. Um, Things will happen uh, not 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 only from India but also China. Uh, if how to say, uh, I mean the two countries will uh, should do something more like that. Thank you, Very Professor. Helpful. Thank you, Professor Hanhua. Uh, I'm delighted. It is two hours eleven minutes past of this discussion. We still have fifty one people with us. China is a continuous interest, but it's very, you know, unusual to have a speaker of this stature and this articulation 
and i think we really enjoyed every part of your presentation we'll have possibly more occasions to interact with you i should not be speaking any more now and i'll hand over now to professor reena mahabra for her uh, vote of thanks uh, thank you swaran thank you very much uh, professor han hua it's been a delight to listen to you and uh, the way you have mentioned that both uh, india and china have been uh, i mean we are neighbors we are uh, civilizational partners and uh, we need to be sensitive of each other's concerns and uh, it's impossible for economic decoupling to happen or people to people decoupling to happen or any other kind of decoupling business wise uh, to happen because chinese investments uh, are well known in india and we uh, do believe in shared growth and shared uh, prosperity and uh, thank you so much uh, for your brilliant address and uh, your patience in answering so many questions uh, you know we had so many people who uh, i'm sure would still have liked to continue and ask you more questions and uh, you responded uh, brilliantly to each one of them uh, so we are truly grateful the report uh, of your uh, lecture today and the interaction will be on our website uh, in a day's time and uh, also the recording on our uh, uh, website association of asia scholars uh, asiascholars.org and uh, of course we've been live on uh, facebook throughout uh, a big thank you to all our participants to ambassador sachin har to professor kin mong soe to nirmal jindal ji to professor srimathi Uh, thank you all for being with us and encouraging us in our efforts on june 10th the next wednesday uh, we would have a speaker from griffith university professor ian hall and uh, we look forward to your joining us also on next wednesday so till then have a wonderful week ahead stay safe stay blessed thank you all very much